The Arminian party agreed that man fell in the Garden of Eden. They believed that this fall was not Adam's alone, but that it was carried down to all of his posterity by natural generation. So what was the point of contention? The Arminian doesn't deny the sinfulness of man, but what he does deny is the depth and the power of the sin in the life of the individual. The Arminians and the Calvinists disagreed over the scope of the fall as it related to the will of man. The Arminians, simply put, believed that man's will was wounded by the fall and that he still had the ability to choose the good over evil in the spiritual realm. The Calvinists, on the other hand, held that since the fall, the only thing unregenerate man could and would choose was inevitably corrupted by his will, motivated by self and evil. The next logical question then becomes, if fallen man can only choose evil, how could he ever choose the ultimate good, the gospel of the Lord Jesus? How can he ever be saved? People are not in their natural state searching for God. God's the one who seeks us out. Christ is the one who comes to seek and to save the lost. Before we deal with election in more depth, we must address one of the most misunderstood teachings of the modern era, what it means to be born again. It's kind of a deep subject. I don't really have all of the depths of my Christianity figured out. But the one thing that I do know that is God came and said to me that if I repented, that, uh, that I would be saved. And so that's what I did. Most modern evangelical Christians have been taught that as a sinner repents of his sin and puts his faith in God, he becomes born again. This is what the Arminian party was advocating and what the Calvinists rejected. How, they asked, can a dead man have faith? The modern church teaches that you have to have faith for to be born again. This is the exact opposite of what Jesus said in John 3. As a matter of fact, in response to the question, how can a man be born again, Jesus did not say, faith, repent and believe. He said it's like the wind, and you don't know where it's going or where it's coming. In other words, he's saying that the new birth is something that you can program, you can determine, it happens and you experience it. Let's take a closer look at the Arminian view by way of the following analogy. Of course no one is interested. If his target audience was simply sick and just needed some medicine, writing out a prescription would make perfect sense. But when the patient is dead, it becomes absurd on the face of it. I think one of the problems that evangelists perhaps have had is to see people not as being dead, but as being sick. You're sick in your sins and you need a little therapy or you need a little medicine and then you can get better. But scripture teaches that we are, are dead and what we need is a spiritual resurrection. God works this miracle on spiritually dead people who have neither the ability nor the desire to live for him. This is what the Bible, numerous church councils, and countless champions of the faith, some of whom we listed in part one, have taught that being born again is a monergistic work, the effort of God alone. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, there are three figures used to designate the new life in Christ. They are birth, creation, and resurrection. And in all of these three things, the one thing that they have in common is the fact that the person or that which is in the Bible is passive. You do nothing to be born. You can do nothing to be resurrected if you're dead. You can do nothing to be created if you're not existing, you see. 
And so it all means that the initiative must come from God's side, not man's side. Dr. R.C. Sproul explains that Arminians have unconverted sinners who are dead in trespasses and sin, bringing themselves to life by choosing to be born again. Christ made it clear that dead people cannot choose anything, that the flesh profits nothing, and that a person must be born of the Spirit before he can even see the kingdom of God, let alone enter it. Man believes the gospel because he has been transformed by the Spirit of God. He is thus given the gift of faith, in which he exercises that faith in believing what God has said about Christ in the scripture. He also responds in repentance and seeks forgiveness from God. Now if the Holy Spirit doesn't come down and give life and take those dry bones and knit them together, what's going to happen? Nothing. They're dead. Which is what all of us are spiritually. We're dead in our trespasses and sin. That, that, that ought to be enough to settle the matter. There is another misunderstanding many evangelicals have about being born again. They view it and being justified or saved as being the same thing. But in reality, they are two different terms that depict two related, but nonetheless distinct events. Being born again enables us to have faith in Christ, something we can never do while still dead in our trespasses and sins. Being born again is the first act, if you will, of God's grace. It makes us new creatures in Christ. And as new creatures, we are no longer haters of God. We are no longer at enmity with God. As the prophet Ezekiel explained, God removes our hearts of stone and replaces them with hearts of flesh. And with the scales now removed from our eyes, we see the holiness of God and the sinfulness of ourselves. And as a result, we repent and have faith in God and what he has done for us through the cross. Being born again must, of necessity, precede faith. So the question remains, how is a sinner born again so that he can have faith in Christ? Because of what God has done before the foundation of the world, he has elected an innumerable amount of people that will respond to the gospel. They will be his followers. They will become disciples of the Lord Jesus. He guarantees it. Here we come to an area of doctrine which ultimately colors our entire understanding of salvation. Many, if not most modern Christians, tend to either ignore or lightly skim over words like chosen, predestination, and election when they see them in their Bibles. The reason for this is simple. The biblical doctrine of election is, humanly speaking, counterintuitive, an offense to the natural human tendency to believe that we've played a part in our own salvation. But the Bible declares this awesome truth of election often and without apology. We need to come to terms with it. For many are called, but few are chosen. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. We could go on, reading scripture after scripture, declaring that we didn't find God. Instead, he found and saved us. As another example, consider the fact that many of the New Testament letters were specifically addressed to the elect. 
Also consider that the word most often translated church in the New Testament is the Greek word ekklesia, meaning the called out ones. The term comes from the same Greek root, eklektos, the word we translate as the elect. So the terms church and the elect are roughly synonymous. The word beloved is another word that refers to the elect, though the passages in which it appears are too numerous to mention. Let's look at just one. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Another term God uses to refer to his elect children is sheep. In John 10, 26, Jesus declared to the unbelieving Jews, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Note that Jesus did not say, because you did not believe, you're not my sheep. Instead, he declared the opposite. They did not believe because they were not members of his flock. The word because assigns the reason for their unbelief. They simply were not his sheep or his elect. His sheep will believe. Matthew Henry, who penned perhaps the most popular and enduring commentary on the Bible, explains the meaning of this passage. Ye, speaking to a group of Jews, are not designed to be my followers. Ye are not of those that were given me by my Father to be brought to grace and glory. Ye are not of the number of the elect, and your unbelief, if you persist in it, will be certain evidence that you are not. As stated earlier, many today either ignore or deny the concept of election. They see it as unfair or unjust. How could a loving God, they ask, choose to give mercy and grace to some and then withhold it from others? Well, before we dare to subject God and His Word to the bar of human conceptions of fairness, consider this. Nobody seems to have a problem that God called out Israel and set them apart and set His love upon them and distinguished them. And you can't argue that here, here's Moses, who's born under a death sentence, who's born to a slave, and here's the Pharaoh, who's born heir to the throne of the most, uh, most powerful kingdom the world has ever known. Now, God didn't give Moses everything he gave this baby Pharaoh, although eventually he did, of course. Then Pharaoh, or then Moses, of course, becomes, uh, is raised in Pharaoh's court. And then does God continue to treat them the same? No, God doesn't come in a bush to Pharaoh and say, hey, Pharaoh, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to take care of you and all your people, and I'm going to give you my law, and I'm going to place you in a land, and I'm going to give you uh, grace galore, and through you the nations will be blessed. No, God did that first to Abraham, and then later on through Moses. And again, nobody seems to have a problem with that. But now in the New Testament, supposedly, God can't set his covenantal love upon this person in a way that's distinct from how he does so with that person, and therefore the difference has to be in the person. Uh, but God explicitly says in the scripture several times, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. You know, as much as we need to be doing theology and need to be doing an apologetic for the things that we believe, we, we never need to lose the, the perspective that God's God and he can do what he wants to do. And who are we to question his ways and his sovereign choices? Where do you get the standard? Where do you stand to get a standard by which you measure God by, you see? He himself is the standard, and he does what he pleases, and only what he pleases. The, the truth is that God is God, and he can do whatever he wants. His job description is to do whatever pleases him. He, he, it, that's, that's how he makes decisions. That's how he conducts himself, according to his own good pleasure, as Scripture says. Now, that's good news to the believer, but it's bad news to those who are rebelling against God. Given the theological climate of the time, the Arminian party had no choice but to deal with the doctrine of election. As we've seen, the remonstrants insisted that the individual's response to God's offer of salvation helped spark their spiritual resurrection, their born-again experience. But at the same time, they acknowledged the clear biblical teaching that God chooses who will be saved. And so they devised a way to supposedly reconcile the obvious tension between these two concepts. According to the Arminian party's formulation, God looks down from the corridors of time and foresaw those who would choose him 
and then ratified their choice by electing them. Therefore, election to the Arminians was conditional based upon man's proper reaction. Quoting again from the Articles of Faith of the National Association of Free Will Baptists, God determined from the beginning to save all who should comply with the conditions of salvation. Hence, by faith in Christ, men become his elect. This was, according to the Synod of Dort, pure Pelagianism. In their official denunciation of the remonstrance, they wrote, For this does away with all effective functioning of God's grace in our conversion and subjects the activity of Almighty God to the will of man. It is contrary to the apostles, who teach that we believe by virtue of the effective working of God's mighty strength and that God fulfills the undeserved goodwill of this kindness and the work of faith in us with power, and likewise that His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And we believe that our salvation is by grace, that even the faith that we have comes as a gift from God. There is nothing that we can lay claim to, nothing in which we can boast. Our salvation entirely comes from the Lord. Dr. J.I. Packer explains, the Arminians say, I owe my election to my faith. The Calvinist says, I owe my faith to my election. People are either elect or non-elect before they are born. There's nothing a person can do to get himself elected. It's not like God has voted for you and the devil has voted against you and now you make your election by voting one way or the other. The Arminian position is not really election, it's ratification. In the end, it's man's vote that decides the outcome. And while the Arminian may and likely will insist that the weight of God's elective power is infinitely greater than Satan's, that the ballot box has been radically stuffed in our favor, there remains no way to get around the final bottom line that one man with the devil's help can frustrate the vote and the desires of Almighty God. Most learned Arminians would draw on numerous passages to buttress their doctrine, but they claim their greatest proof text is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The word foreknew was understood by the Arminians to mean that God knew or saw beforehand which sinners would believe and that he then predestined them to salvation based upon this knowledge. Notice, however, that the text does not say that God knew something about particular individuals, that they would do this or that, or that he saw their actions, even though both statements are true, Rather, it states that God knew the individuals themselves. The word whom is the object of the verb, and the object denotes persons, not events or happenings. But before the beginning of time, the Bible says whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. The word foreknow does not mean foresee, it means to forelove. In Genesis 4.1, we're told that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Well, if all he did was intellectually foresee uh, Eve, she never would have conceived. The point is, he made her the object of his loving affections and she conceived. And so in Romans 8, it says, whom he foreloved, those whom he foreknew, those he predestined, whom he set his love upon, those whom he chose according to the good pleasure of his will. He determined that in time, they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Romans 8 says those he foreknew, he predestined to become sons of God. And of course, the standard Arminian view is that to foreknow just means to foresee and just sort of know what's going to happen without really affecting it. But the word really means to forelove, kind of in an apprehended sense, that, that God is actively uh, drawing that person and actively turned towards that person, uh, not just for, for knowing in a distant sense, but in a relational sense. Addressing the elect nation of Israel in Amos 3.2, God declares, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Surely the Lord had knowledge of and can see all the actions of every family on the earth, but he knew or loved Israel in a special way and set his heart upon them alone. The Arminian attempt to redefine the doctrine of election failed. 
In contradistinction to the doctrine of conditional election, the confessions of the Dutch church taught what is called unconditional election. They believe that God elected certain individuals in Christ before the foundations of the world based upon Christ's sacrifice. His reason for selecting the ones he did was solely based upon his own goodwill and pleasure. He loved them even though they were just as deserving of his wrath as those he did not love. And those whom he elected to love, through the power and regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, he causes them to be born again, whereby they willingly accept Christ. So what was the basis of God's electing one and not the other? That's a fascinating question. And I want to tell you, the Bible never answers it. It answers it in the negative. It tells you what are not the things that are the basis for your election. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you will see that Paul says, you see your calling, brethren. Now, he's talking about calling in the theological sense where the Holy Spirit calls us unto Christ for salvation. He's not talking about a calling as a musician or a preacher or something like that. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many mighty are called, not many noble are called, not many of the great people of this world are called. We don't have the time to look at all the verses that illuminate this doctrine. Perhaps the passage that most directly addresses it is found in the ninth chapter of Romans. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who called, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Paul gives us, as an illustration, two real flesh and blood Old Testament figures, Jacob and his older brother Esau. And to remove all ambiguity concerning the mind-blowing implications of this passage, Paul throws diplomacy out the window and cuts right to the bottom line. The reason for choosing one over the other is so that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Election, in other words, is of God, by God, and through God. Nowhere is man given even a scintilla of responsibility for his election. Nowhere does man have any room to boast. Paul concludes this passage by echoing a verse from Malachi. And in his mouth it becomes one of the most controversial statements in the entire Bible. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Charles Spurgeon comments on this passage. Why did God love Jacob and hate Esau? I can tell you why God loves Jacob. It's sovereign grace. There was nothing in Jacob that could make God love him. There was everything about him that might have made God hate him as much as he did Esau and a great deal more. But it was because God is infinitely gracious that he loved Jacob and because he is sovereign in his dispensation of his grace that he chose Jacob as an object of that love. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, the base things of the world, the things that are nothing. These are the things that God has chosen that no flesh may glory, glory in his sight. So the only reasons that we're told why anybody is chosen is because we are weak, foolish, and base and don't amount to anything. Modern-day commentators, as well as the Arminian Remonstrants, attempted to soften the blow of this passage by saying that God loved Jacob more than he loved Esau, and therefore it really wasn't hate. They argue that the word translated hate means unloved or less loved, as if this really makes any difference. Again, quoting Charles Spurgeon. It's a terrible text, and I will be honest with it if I can. One man says the word hate doesn't mean hate. It means love less. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I loved less. It may be so, but I don't believe it is. I like to take it and let it stand just as it is. The fact is, God loved Jacob and he did not love Esau. 
He did choose Jacob, but he did not choose Esau. However one wants to understand the word hate, whether literally or figuratively, it's clear that whatever God had for Jacob, he did not have for Esau. And it's clear from the text that the love God had for Jacob was not conditional, but unconditional. For neither Jacob nor Esau had yet been born, nor done anything good or evil. No one would say that a human being has to love everyone alike. God does have a general love for all men. He does love all men in the sense of sending sunshine and rain upon the wicked as well as upon the righteous. But there are some people for whom he has had a special love. And just as a man has a special love for his wife and his children, God has the right to have a special love for those that are the objects of his affection. Pastor Spurgeon continues, Why did God hate Esau? Why does God hate any man? I defy anyone to give any answer but this, because that man deserves to be hated. No reply but that can be true. If God deals severely with any person, it's because that person deserves all that he gets. God owes salvation to no one. God would be entirely just if he had uh, condemned Adam, condemned the race uh, uh, immediately after the fall. God would be just to send every single person to hell because what our sin deserves is the eternal wrath and cursing of God. The Synod of Dort explained it this way, God does not owe this grace to anyone. For what could God owe to one who has nothing to give that can be paid back? Indeed, what could God owe to one who has nothing of his own to give but sin and falsehood? It would be right of God to destroy all of us for our sins. And if he would have mercy on some, he has the right to do that. You know, Spurgeon uses an analogy of a man walking down the street and finding ten beggars. He's not obligated to give any of the beggars anything, but if he chooses to give one of the beggars some money, then what he's done is very gracious, and no one can charge him with injustice. And the reason is those beggars don't have any claims upon the man's money. In the same way, we have no claims upon God's goodness or God's favor, and the fact that God saves anyone declares him to be an incredibly gracious and loving God. As I've said before, election puts nobody in hell and a vast multitude of people in heaven that wouldn't be there otherwise. In heaven, we have nothing to boast about in ourselves. In hell, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Both the Holy Spirit and Paul knew that this teaching was going to be controversial and purposely set out to address the very natural human objections from the outset. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. When I say that to people, they say, that's not fair. This is exactly the objection that the Apostle Paul anticipated in the ninth chapter of Romans when he talks about these, well, the doctrine of election and the difference between Jacob and Esau. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Before they were ever born, before they had done anything, good or evil. The question I have for those that disagree with the doctrine of unconditional election is this. Does your view of election provoke the same kind of antagonism that Paul's does? Would you have ever included the objection that the Apostle Paul includes in Romans chapter 9? If election is based upon foreseen faith or based upon something in man, then why in the world does Paul anticipate this objection? Who would ever charge God with being unjust or unfair? This last observation is a vital point. There are many in view attempts to make the doctrine of election seem fair to the mind of man. But the Apostle Paul takes the opposite tack. Rather than making it more palatable, he continues to emphasize the absolute sovereignty of God by giving us another Old Testament example. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. 
For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Is Paul saying that God actually hardens people's hearts? That he makes them stonier than they already are? Well, there's no getting around it. Six times in the Exodus account, we're told, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it's important to understand how God accomplished this. He didn't just arbitrarily harden Pharaoh's heart against his will. Three times it declares that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. What happened is that God sovereignly created situations where Pharaoh was confronted with the decision as to whether to obey God or instead lean to his own will and understanding. Given his sinful nature and the fact that God didn't grant him the grace to overcome that nature, Pharaoh chose sin of his own accord. And as sin always does, it brought forth spiritual decay and death. And so Pharaoh's heart became harder with each successive act of rebellion. God brought forth the test, but it was Pharaoh that failed them. This same principle of withholding the gift of grace was reflected in Jesus' own earthly ministry many centuries later. When asked by his disciples why he spoke to the people in parables, the Lord replied, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. In other words, as with Pharaoh, there are people that God has chosen not to help believe. And when confronted with the truth, it is these people who of their own accord will choose to harden their hearts and persecute the truth. In fact, in their case, they opted to nail it to a cross. Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, when he contemplates the fact that many of the people in the town where he did his main public ministry in Caesarea had not believed or received the gospel, he thanked God that, that God had hidden the gospel from the wise and the prudent and had revealed it unto babes. And then he went on to express his reason for that thanksgiving because it was good in your sight father so it was the father's choice as to who was to be re a recipient of the gospel and who would be hard-hearted toward it logically this answer raises another question and paul anticipates it by asking you will say to me then why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will his answer is a stiff rebuke to any man who would dare sit in judgment on God. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Paul insists that as sinners we have no rights before God. We have no claims on his mercy. God could have elected everyone. He could have elected no one. The choice, therefore, was his and his alone. Students come to me all the time and they ask me a myriad of theological questions. And I've never had a student come to me and say to me, R.C., why does God save anybody? That's the real question. Not why is there only one way. Why does he save me? I can't, I can't imagine why he would save a, a creation that is in manifest consistent, impenitent rebellion against his glory and against his majesty. And yet, God's grace is so profound that he sends his son and that he, God initiates a plan of salvation, a plan of redemption, and it doesn't include the salvation of everybody. I don't know why he doesn't save everybody. I don't know why he saves anybody. So those are both questions that I'd like to have to ask him because I can't answer them for him. Paul continues, Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor?
What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. John Gill explains, God is represented as the potter and men as clay in his hands, and God appoints out of it persons to different uses and purposes for his own glory as he sees fit. Many people think they have trouble with election or predestination, but as I said earlier, their problem is really with the doctrine of man. They don't understand or believe the doctrine of the fall of man. They basically deny original sin because once you acknowledge that man is fallen and man is born in a sinful condition that his heart mind and will are against God then you will see that the election is essential if anybody is going to go to heaven the ninth chapter of Romans as well as numerous other passages led the Synod of Dort to reject the Arminian doctrine of conditional election they labeled it heresy, likened it to Pelagianism, and called it an error by which the Dutch churches have for some time been disturbed. Election, according to the Synod of Dort, does not save anyone. It simply marked those in Christ whom God, of his own free will, chose to be the objects of his affection and mercy. Election is in Christ, who by his blood purchased everything that chose a need for salvation, including regeneration and faith. And this teaching became the next big issue of contention for the Armenian party. Mm -hmm.